having a little bit of lightheartedness around there, and of course music has so much humor in it. And uh, and I think that uh, this is one of, you know a lot uh, one of the main ingredients. In music is is humor. You have to be able to see it, and so uh, and to also enjoy it. So this I just feel that it's a very natural part of things. But because of your attitude, you've been able to uh, get a lot of people interested in serious music because you've had this wonderful, you show this wonderful sense of humor that you possess. You've done some programming that a lot of serious musicians would not have done. And those people have seen you on television. They come into your concerts. And for the first time, they, they really are able to hear and listen to serious music. Well, I, I'm, I'm actually glad. But the thing is that, again, you know, to be a performer, uh, you're in the, uh, if you want to call it, business of contact with the audience. That's what you are doing, basically. You are performing for an audience. So if you're performing for an audience, uh, uh, I always feel that for example, when I play recitals, I always like to talk to the audience. You know, if it, there's always a natural barrier when you go out on stage and say, my God, there is this person going on stage and going to play for us. And God, it's, uh, should we be frightened or not? But the minute you talk to the people, they relax, and then they're able, actually able to enjoy the music much more. So do you think that enough performers, though, are able to do that? Well, look, it's, it's the way you feel. You know, I mean, some performers don't feel that they're comfortable, and some performers feel that they are comfortable in communic communicating extra, taking that extra uh, uh, step by, by actually talking and, uh, you know, maybe telling a story about a piece if you feel the piece is interesting and you say a, a couple of words about the piece, you know, and so on. And it makes everybody relax more and then, then just have better time, you know. If people aren't familiar with classical music, if it's the first time that they're really, uh, that they've become aware of it mm -hmm. by coming to one of your concerts, mm -hmm. it would seem to me that that would be very valuable to tell them about the piece because, as you said, Music has a lot of humor in it if you can see it. Well, Many it has, people can't. Exactly. And, and I also I say to people, if you go to a concert, whether it's an orchestral concert or whether it's a recital or opera, whatever it is, if you can get a hold, especially in this day and age where uh, there's so much uh, uh, emphasis on recordings and so on, if there's a piece you don't know, let's say it's a contemporary work or something that's contemporary to you and that you don't know it, get a record listen to it a couple of times so that when you go to the concert hall you actually gee i that sounds familiar to me i know this you know i can enjoy it a bit more you know people sometimes uh, are expected to make judgments yay or nay about a work that they've never heard before in one hearing and to me that's kind of unfair you know when you think about uh, what goes on in rock and pop music and when you think how the saturation that yes. a recording gets uh, we're talking about three or four minutes keeps constantly, constantly playing it over and over again, and yet somebody going to the concert and wants to hear a, a work that they've never heard before one time and say, I like that, you know, or I hated it. You know, the judgment is not really accurate because you've got to give it uh, a little bit of a chance. Doesn't that go back to a certain degree to what they say about, or used to say anyway, about musical comedies? The ones that were really successful, and now I'm going back to, uh, like, Oklahoma right. and Carousel, mm -hmm. The reason why they were so popular is that people would walk out of the theater whistling the tune. Yes. And then you knew if you had exactly. a hit musical That's or right. not. If it was catchy, you knew that it, that it caught your imagination. But the thing is that uh, classical music is, you know, in, in some ways a very profound uh, artistic expression of, of the composers. And it's more difficult. It doesn't come as easy, you know, when you listen to a late Beethoven quartet. Uh, you know, and if you are not, if you're not trained to listen to it, the first time you will listen to it, you're going to have a very hard time appreciating what it is. You know, it's you may a, not appreciate it at all the first time. E exactly, and and uh, the thing is that uh, uh, I've had the most wonderful experience of actually playing in uh, group, doing one of the late Beethoven quartets. I'm, I'm just mentioning late Beethoven because it's such a, an esoteric kind of way that he's been writing and at the same time he wasn't able to hear anything and he wrote those incredible works and we worked for three weeks rehearsing until it finally started to make sense to us as a group and then we only gave it a fairly good performance not an ideal one but uh, you know if you come to a concert obviously and listen to something like this for the first time and uh, you know you can't just ask the music hey come on hit me you know do yes. something for me, you know, unless you are trained for it. You know, the interesting thing about that, 
when I went to uh, high school and to college, in college I ended up majoring in music, mm -hmm. in voice, and did a lot of operatic roles. I didn't appreci appreciate opera when I first started working on arias mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, what I really wanted to do with my life when I was in high school, that, oh, it would be wonderful to be able to, to sing and perform on Broadway. Right. And that's what I wanted to yeah. do, musical yeah. comedy. And then I started learning arias, and at first I didn't like them. And then I found that not only did I like them, but I began to love them yeah. because I understood yeah. them. It does yeah, take it's, time. Yeah, it's a training. It takes a, it's a, it takes a training. And, and the thing is that certain kinds, uh, uh, certain pieces in, in the classical music repertoire are obviously easier to listen to than others. You know? Yes. People say to me, you know, uh, I've just started with this classical music, you know, and what should I start with? And I usually say to them, you know, you don't start with Stockhausen and you don't start with, uh, you know, with uh, even Prokofiev or, or Bartok, but you start with something that is, you know, much more direct to you. We're talking about Mozart, we're talking about Bach, uh, you know, Haydn, and then, you know, we can graduate into Beethoven. And, and when you talked about music having a sense of humor, one of the great revelations to me in studying opera and in performing certain operas was the great sense of humor that Mozart had. Oh, well, you're talking about, for me, probably the greatest opera composer. I agree I with mean, you. I mean, I know that Verdi Verdiites are going to attack me. I mean, I'm not and taking Puccini anything away. And Puccini have That's got right. you in big trouble. I like though. Puccini myself. But, you know, I mean, uh, Mozart, that's, that's fantastic. I mean, that's wonderful music. He had a whole sense of um, uh, attitude in all of his operas were showing that the, the people of nobility in most of his operas, the people of nobility were really not very smart. <laughs> and the people who were not of nobility, such as the servants, were very smart. And, and he always did that kind of turnaround, which gave you a, a, his sense of humor and the way he saw the world. Yeah, and I love, I love the way he used the characters with the voices, the type of voice used for the kind of character that he has to convey and so on. It's fascinating. But until someone really spends time on classical music, whether it be uh, for the voice or whether it be for the orchestra or for an individual instrument, I really don't think that you can have instant enjoyment. Well, I think in some, some instances you could. I, I think that, that in, in, in many, many ways television has really helped this kind of thing. In other words, you know, I don't want us talking like this and frightening people away from listening to, to opera or to classical music because, oh my God, you know, I need to spend years to enjoy it. That's not really entirely It's true. not years, but it is, you have to give some time. You have to give some time, but the thing is that I think that now uh, that operas are being shown all the time on television, I think with the translation, I personally think it's terrific. To, to have a little translation of what, what they're saying, rather than saying somebody saying, oh, blah, 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 blah. and I said, what is he saying there? You know, <laughs> yeah. At least you can see it on the screen. Um, a lot of uh, concerts uh, are very, very good. You know, people just have it in their house. And as you say, when you see it on television, you're more likely to say, hey, gee, why don't I try a concert and see how it is? Because, you know, there is, there is nothing like a live concert. Yes. I mean, television is terrific and so on, but the vibration, the atmosphere, everything that goes on when you sit in a concert hall and you listen to a, to a, to a concert, is there's nothing that can replace that. It's, it's very exciting. You knew that you wanted to be a violinist when you were very young. Um, How old? About, uh, I wanted to play, I, look, you don't know that you want to be a concert violinist from the very beginning. You just know that you want to play the violin, all right? So all right. I wanted first to play when I was three and a half. And uh, when I was a little bit after four, I, uh, I had polio. So the polio uh, laid me and sort of postponed until I was five. And then I started to play when I was five years old. With a second-hand fiddle that your parents had bought oh, for you. Oh, you are. Who can afford the first hand? Yeah, yes. Actually, <laughs> actually, it was a sort of a first hand. The second hands are more expensive. I was going to say that because I think you started off with a six-dollar fiddle yeah, when you were a little guy. At that time, it was, uh, let's see, the dollar, let's see, how's the shekel at the dollar now with this? <laughs> yeah, that was actually a $40,000 fiddle when I started, you know, <laughs> now with all the inflation. <laughs> and now I read that you play a Stradivarius that is valued at somewhere around 400,000. Well, you know, it's all a question of what, what the market will bear. You know, it's, it's uh, you know, uh, I suppose, uh, you know, those, those, the prices of these things is, it, it's almost meaningless. You know, if you can, whatever something fetches, 
you get. You know, it's yes. it's, it's it's funny. I, I never I never get to understand this kind of a thing, but. Uh, the making of a violin has always been called uh, an art form mm -hmm, because it depends on yeah. the kind of wood and how it's put together yeah. and which master put it together because right. some knew how to put one together that produced a much better tone than well, others. It's one of the great mysteries still. Uh, what makes the older violins sound wonderful and, and uh, every now and then somebody comes and says, you know, I have the, I have the formula. And people have been trying to do it scientifically and, and, and not so scientifically and uh, there's still uh, there's a, still a problem of trying to duplicate really wonderful sound of the old masters when you listen to a, a violinist when you listen to a concerto mm -hmm. and you're listening either over television or radio or from a recording can you possibly have any idea of what kind of instrument they're playing um who the instrument maker it's a very would be? good question in a recording, I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure because you see, when you play an instrument, whether let's let's take two obvious examples: a Strad, Stradivarius, and a Guarnerius. Now, those are the two top instruments, and they are so different in sound from each other. It's like apples and oranges. It's it's quite fascinating. Uh, the Guarneri has a much darker tone. Uh, the Strad has much more of a soprano, high kind of quality. Uh, obviously, as far as playing is concerned, they're also very, very different. You know, you can play much rougher on a Guarneri. You have to be much more careful to produce a, a nice sound from the Strad because it'll break under. Yeah, I, I mean, the sound will break. So, yes. so you're talking about two different kind of uh, instruments. However, if you were to, out of context, uh, get violinist A to play uh, two instruments, the characteristics of the violinist are so strong that the instrument will not sound that much different unless obviously you play them side by side, right. you know, and then you say, oh, let's hear instrument A, let's hear instrument B. But that's why, you know, your question about the recording, I'm not so sure, because in the recording, uh, you know, you hear an artist who has been playing an instrument for years, and, you know, so it's part of you already. So all the characteristics in your playing, you know, you know the instrument, the instrument knows you, you know, you don't, you know, what you can give, what you can't give. And what you can get so, out of it. Yeah. Yes. So you sound like you, you know, you don't but if sound there like were, the instrument. if there were ten people lined up and you yeah. were blindfolded and each one of them had a different violin, yeah. you would probably be able to identify the the strong yeah the strong if there's a real strong difference characters like i uh, described yes i would mm -hmm. i would but it would not be easy it wouldn't be so easy you know how does someone this day and age who <clears throat> sees that their child has an interest in music mm -hmm. as many children do when they're around six or seven years right. old they all profess an interest in playing the piano, particularly if there's one in the house. Right. They will try right. to compose themselves. Mm -hmm. And then you get them started uh, officially on lessons. Right. And even if you have a wonderful teacher, there's nobody in the, there's no child in the world that's going to want to practice. How are you Most able to don't. encourage them long enough so that they can feel the rewards that come from being able to well, be accomplished with okay. an instrument? Okay, that's a good question again. Uh, first of all, uh, you have to see from the child, you have to get a vibration. Does the child like music? Does the child really want to play? Now, obviously, you know, when you're five or six, uh, you have to sort of uh, touch it, uh, you know, at uh, little subtle, more, more subtle things, you know. Uh, I mean, but the thing is, does a child have an ear? Yes. Or, or, and, and the thing is that sometimes uh, you see kids who are very, very interested and if you take them to a good teacher, you can, you can say that, okay, this child shows promise and it's worth looking into this. Now, the way you uh, look into uh, making a child study music is that music should be, for me, part of education, whether you're going to be a, music, a professional musician or not. I think that somebody without music really misses a lot. Okay. And so I think that if, you, if a child wants to study the piano, I think it's wonderful. I think that piano, for me, I always recommend the first thing to study in music is, is the piano, rather than, than a single uh, well, you can learn line chord instrument. structures, you exactly. can learn everything. You know, the minute you study piano, there's a much more complete kind of musical education. So, uh... But should a parent stay, I mean, say the child shows promise. Yeah. But doesn't want to practice. Yeah. Enjoys the lesson each week, mm -hmm. but doesn't want to do much in between. Right, right. 
I mean, a parent has two choices. They can either say, if they want it bad enough, they would practice, and if they're not going to practice, then I think we better discontinue the lessons. Yeah, I... Or they can stand over them with a whip, as you read about certain stories yeah, where parents is, do exactly. that, you know. Well, there is a happy medium. I think that uh, you're right. Nobody wants to practice on their own, at least uh, most people don't. Uh, there are some exceptions. And, uh, and the thing is that you can sort of force gently and, and see how the child reacts. You know, sometimes children like to be forced a little bit so they feel that they have a structure mm -hmm. in, in their life. And, and, and then while, while they practice, you see if there is an enjoyment or not. Usually, when somebody likes music and when somebody has good results with the instrument, they would want to practice. They would maybe not go out of their way to practice, but they would want to practice because it's a real sense of satisfaction when you accomplish something and something comes out nice. You I practice so. a lot even now, do you not? Well, uh, you have another question for me? No. <laughs> <laughs> After no. all that, you're not going to tell me that you don't practice. Well, no, I'll tell you, practicing, uh, I, I'm not trying to evade the question. I, know. I, I will get to your to, to, to answer your question. No, first of all, I'd like to say that practicing is an individual thing. Certain people need a routine every day, a certain amount of hours. They have to have it. Certain people don't feel they have to have it. And, uh, that doesn't mean that one person is better than the other, more talented or less talented. It's a question of habit. It's a question of make, what makes you comfortable right. and so on. Now, in my case, uh, up till about the age of 18 or 19, I practiced more or less uh, every, you know, I had a routine. I practiced three or four hours a day, but that's all that I did. I didn't do, I wasn't a crazy eight-hour practicer and so on. I never was. Uh, and then afterwards, I sort of said, okay, that's fine, you know, and I'm now going to practice whenever I feel the need to practice, meaning either you're studying a new piece or uh, you are reviewing something that you feel is not quite right, that you, you feel that you didn't like the way you played and you want to rework it and so on and so forth. So I, I'm, I'm basically as, uh, sort of, uh, I practice when I feel there is a need. So I don't do this routine. Uh, that's you don't not put my, away an hour or two I don't put away, every day. No, I don't. You know, sometimes, uh, sometimes I do it. It's very funny. On vacation, I'm more likely to have more of a routine because, you know, wake up in the morning, go to the beach, practice an hour, go to the beach, practice yeah. an hour, you know. But uh, I, I don't feel uh, the need to, you know, like, oh, my God, I didn't practice today. What's going to happen to me? That's not my kind of situation. We have to take a commercial break or something dreadful will happen to right. me. We'll do that right now and we'll come back right after these. <laughs> Welcome back. My guest this evening is Itzhak Perlman. We've been speaking about, uh, oh, everything connected with music. Let's talk more about you. You had mentioned that uh, it was about, you were about three when you first realized that you wanted to play the violin and uh, really about six when you started playing. Five. Five, Five sorry. Yeah. Right. Off the year, year no <laughs> and and that at four and a half you uh, were stricken with polio right. and confined uh, to bed for a long time, and then then to a wheelchair. It must have really taken some great dedication on your part. Well, no, actually, I'll tell you what exactly happened. There was no wheelchair at that time. I don't think we could afford a wheelchair. <laughs> what happened was uh, I immediately was, you know, when you're a kid, uh, you're talking about a four-year-old kid. Uh, you get used to things very quickly, very quickly. You know, it becomes a way of life. You know, I had to have leg braces and, and crutches. Ba basically, that's what happened with me. And I immediately started to walk with those things, and they become second nature to you. Uh, that's number one. And, of course, immediately afterward, I said, so, you know, I wanted to play the fiddle, you know, and now it's, uh, it's time. I still want to play. But what is very important is the attitude of your parents and people around you. Mm. Uh, in my case, uh, my parents were absolutely terrific. You know, they said, okay, uh, you know, uh, polio, no use of legs, use of arms, right? Okay, so what they did, they, we used to live in Tel Aviv at the, uh, in the sort of, if you want to call it, downtown section where there's a lot of traffic and not that much place to play around. You know, it was, you know, cement and, and traffic. So we moved to a slightly, to a residential section of Tel Aviv, where there was a school about a block away. And I was able to walk to school every day. And, uh, and, uh, and that's basically the change that they made 
for my benefit, you know, because, uh, you know, because I lost power of, of walking. Uh, and uh, then I started the violin lessons, and that was, that was it. So, as far as I'm concerned, uh, I didn't feel at that time that I was doing something uh, incredible. A lot of people say, well, what an heroic thing you've been doing. That's not true. I did what I was able to do. Uh, I, nobody told me otherwise. Nobody said, well, come on, you can't play the violin right now, now that you, you are, you know, you have polio and, and, and your, your legs are paralyzed, you can't play the violin. Nobody said that to me because it wasn't true. And I always say to people, whenever you have a problem, separate your problem from, from your non-problem. You know, you have to separate the things. Mm -hmm. You know, when you have a disability, uh, if, if, if you can't move a certain part of your body, you say, okay, I can't move that part, but what part can I move and, and do something with it? If you can't move anything, you know, you can, you can use your brain. So it's, it's, the, it's actually having the right perspective as to what is the problem. Yes. And a lot of people tend to put everything in one bunch, you know, in one grouping. And that's the problem that... Uh, Never that thinking that, uh, that anyone would wish for uh, a disability or that a disability could ever be a positive thing. Mm -hmm. But putting it in its perspective, mm -hmm. the fact that you did have polio mm -hmm. and that uh, your arms were very strong and you did like the violin, do you think probably because of the after effects of polio that you even became more interested in practicing the violin. I mean, can a disability, I guess, change the course of your life well, and, and lead you to a more positive realization? Well, I don't know. I, I really don't think that I can answer this question, you know, because in other words, I cannot have two kinds of lives. I cannot say, well, what if I was not disabled? Would I still play the fiddle? Yes, and would, you, would I have practiced and as much I as a kid exactly. or would I have been out playing football? Exactly. Well, I was out playing anyway, and, and let me tell you something. I didn't like to practice. I didn't, you know, I was mm -hmm. pushed to practice, you know, and uh, I was very, very happy to play with the kids outside. And we had, uh, you know, other kids, and I was always, uh, but the thing is, my parents said, look, you got to practice, and my teachers told me that I had a certain amount of talent. And so they said, fine. And so the people, you know, I always say this, uh, the, 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 uh, the children, uh, my friends and kids around the, in the neighborhood felt that the, the strange thing about me was not that I walked with crutches, but the strange thing about me was that I had to practice three hours a day on some silly instrument, you know, uh, instead of just uh, going outside. So, uh, but again, let me just emphasize that what really helped me was the attitude of people around me. And uh, now in retrospect, I can see how, how important it is, you know, and yes. as a matter of fact, the attitudes around me were so healthy that later on, when certain people doubted that I was going to be able to have a career. I didn't understand at all what they were doubting. I, th I, I thought it was for different reasons, you know, maybe uh, people are jealous or this or that or some intrigue. But right now, in retrospect, I can see that the reason that they doubted was that they said, my God, he, he, if he walks like this, how can he have a career? How can he travel? How can he maneuver and so on and so forth? I think that was probably the, the, the reason for the doubts. People react, it seems to me, in, in two basic ways to anything that happens to them in, in life. They either react positively or they react negatively mm -hmm. to something that's happened to mm -hmm. them. And, and evidently your parents instilled to you to look for the positive way. Oh, absolutely. And they did it without, you know, they did it. It's, it's fascinating, you know, when you, think, when you see a lot of parents today, you know, you have a lot of books, you know, how to handle this situation, how to handle that. And they did it totally instinctively. It was fun. They did, you know, they, they managed to do all the right things. It's very nice. Yes. It's very nice. We have to take another time out. But we'll be right back. woman is my guest this evening. Oh, come on, do it. Do it on the air. Every time we go 10 seconds, 5 seconds, come on. Let her rip. <laughs> Let her rip, he says. Uh, it's so terrific when, when you think of the attitude that you were speaking of, of your parents. And you said that's something that you'd like to continue talking about is the attitude and, and how kids today are affected by attitudes around them. Yeah, well, it's, uh, uh, attitudes are not just affected. What, what I'm talking about is the, the attitudes of society when it comes to the disabled starts, you know, from the childhood attitude towards children. If, if it's a bad one, you know, it doesn't change. It can have, be the same kind of attitude towards grown-ups who have you know, disabilities yes. of some sort. 
And uh, I find that uh, one of the reasons that the movement, whether it's uh, disability rights, civil rights, or uh, you know, attitudinal barriers and so on, that we have uh, architectural barriers, it all stems for lack of awareness and kind of wrong attitudes. You know, nobody uh, is, you know, a lot of people are afraid of people with disabilities. You know? uh, and I think in only in recent years have many people been honest enough to admit that. Mm, mm, absolutely. But and isn't it important that it's been admitted because once you become aware of something, well, some, you can change it? Yeah, well, that's true. But some people don't know even that they're afraid. They just, and as a result, the fear is just shows by the way they handle you, if you want. Or don't or handle or don't you. Handle you or, walk, or don't handle you. Walk away from you exactly. or walk to the other side of the street. Exactly. Or don't want to face this thing, you know. And, and I always say, you know, people ask me, what do you think about attitudes today? And I say, look, things happen to me, you know, and I'm supposed to be, quote, you know, famous or, you know, I'm supposed to be, uh, uh, you know, fairly known and so on. And I still get a lot of, of, uh, of situations in which I can't believe that people are just either afraid to look at me look me in the eye, mm. the minute they recognize me, then it's no problem, oh, because there is the familiarity, eye, yes. you know, it's familiar, there's no problem. But the minute you're, and also, I, I, I keep plugging at that, there is even a difference of people's attitude between somebody standing up and somebody sitting down in a wheelchair. Yes. If I stood up with my crutches, people will look at you, you know, let's say that you have uh, uh, people who don't know who you are, right, and they will look at you and they will talk to you, feel much freer. Because you're more or less on, on their level. The minute you're in a wheelchair, you stop being able to understand. You're not supposed to be able to understand because people don't talk to you. They talk at the person who wheels you. You are maybe slightly have a problem with the hearing because all of a sudden they talk a little louder and maybe a little slower. <laughs> you think it's a joke, but it's not. No, it's I so don't. true. Yes, I you know, And I have so many people... Uh, sometimes they come to me and say, you know, this is unbelievable, you know, I had to spend a couple of weeks in a chair because I broke uh, my ankle skiing or something. And boy, what, what is happening? You know, the, uh, people stop talking to me, you know, they're, they're having problems uh, communicating with me and so on. And, and, and you know, I, I always mention this uh, situation because it's, it's very basic, but it's, it's at the basis of what all the problems are, you know, of, of communicating, of society communicating. When you say people. fear, <clears throat> where, where do you think that fear stems from? What are they afraid of? Unknown. They're afraid of, uh, when they see somebody in a chair or they, uh, or they hear somebody, let's say, talk funny and not quite regular, uh, not, uh, you know, not uh, uh, like you talk, you know, but talk with, with some problem or whatever it is, my God, what's the matter? My God, will I offend this person? How many times do you see people talk to somebody who has a speech problem, whether it's a result of, uh, of uh, muscular dystrophy or whatever it is, and are afraid to say, excuse me, could you repeat that, please? I didn't understand you. Yes. I mean, you're afraid to say that. A lot of people are afraid. No, they'd rather say, aha, uh -huh, yes, mm-hmm, mm -hmm, yes, mm-hmm, and not understand anything. It's the fear, maybe, maybe I will offend this person. And it's not giving this person a chance, you know, an equal chance. Uh, you know, if, if uh, and this goes into so many other areas, you know, that people then are afraid to uh, consider you for a job. They're afraid, uh, then they don't know about what you need. You know, uh, in my situation, uh, architectural barriers, for example, is something that's very important to me in, in, uh, as far as mobility is concerned. You know? And as far as your work is concerned, I read that's a right. story once where you were performing at a conc concert house in uh, Tel Aviv, I believe it was, mm. and you performed there and the dressing room was on the f on f like four floors uh, from yeah, where the, hall, right. where the stage right. itself yeah, was. Yeah. And you finally told them after I said their that's performance. that's the last time. But I, there's, there's now the last time until I'm you here, get an elevator. elevator. There is the Perlman elevator is now there. It was in Haifa, and yes. I'm proud to tell you. I also have uh, the Perlman toilet, which is in Buffalo. Yes. <laughs> well, somebody came to me and said to me, "Listen, we won't be able to uh, we won't, we won't be able to come to your concert anymore." He, uh, he says, "I have." He said. Uh, 
uh, MS and it's progressive and he says all of a sudden he says I'm, I'm unable to uh, anymore because there are no laboratories on the main floor and so can you do something about it so that was a pension fund concert and after the concert they invited me to a party and uh, the first time they introduced me to the, uh, the chairman of the board of the orchestra and I says how do you do uh, what about some uh, laboratories on the main floor and he said do me a favor write me a letter and, with, and I'll send it copies to all the members of the board, and by God, they put laboratories on the main floor. For me, uh, something like this uh, gives me such, you know, I'm proud of that. Of but the course. thing is that then, on the other hand, I said to myself, why is it that I have to do that? Why is it that it's not something logical that architects just do it automatically? Why is it that it takes me, you know, you know I'm, I've become sort of an amateur blueprint reader, you know, you know, architects just don't have the kind of education, you know. Uh, all they think about is visual but things, but they it. don't think about uh, something that will be able to be uh, useful. It's a know. lack of knowledge and understanding. Exactly. As far as to what the needs are and there is of no people who are handicapped. Uh, that's number disabled. one. Number two, there is no education. There's no formal education in architecture schools for barrier-free design. It's not something that is automatic. They got maybe workshops or maybe special things. But for me, and I've, I've, I've written to Washington to the uh, accreditation board, I think that's the name of it, of architect school. And I didn't get uh, great results from that. But I feel that architects are, as far as architectural barriers are concerned, if they had awareness and knowledge of the things so that it doesn't have to have a Perlman to go someplace and to, to say, hey, uh, there are five steps here and you've got plenty of room for a ramp. Why don't you put a ramp? You know, I was just recently in a place where they were changing the stairs to another kind of stairs. So I said to them, I said, what are you doing? So yesterday I got a letter and they said they're going to change it and they're going to build a ramp. Now, why does it have to be me only to yes. say those things? Why can it be an automatic thing? Why did, can, it, can it come from just plain logic and some sort of familiarity with, for, with problems of a very large number of citizens that have a problem? You know, you know you're not talking about just the glaring kind of a disability, whether it's from somebody like myself walking with crutches or somebody else who is in a wheelchair. You're talking about people who are elderly, who are unable to walk upstairs. You're talking about people who have heart problems, uh, rheumatoid problems that, that, are, that are not visible. And yet, so it's not just for the special few people that you're doing these things. One of the other things you mentioned uh, was the fact that when they make entrances for people who are disabled, don't make them over on the side of the building or right. away from the main entrance. Right. Don't make people leave their friends and to, and to show right. their differences because they have to go in different doorways. Correct. Correct. It's the, it's the main, you know, it's what I call accessibility with dignity. It's that, that you, you, you have an alternate way to go in, but it's with everybody else, you know, and it can be done. You know, people still think that it's something of a, of a pain, that it's something of a nuisance that, oh, you know, we have to put the ramp in, you know, for, well, let's do it on the side here. You can go around or you can go through the garage, you can take the freight elevator and so on. It says, that's not access in my, in my book. Yes. That's almost... A that's, it's, it's degrading in some ways, you know, and, uh, but, but I think that the more, hopefully, the more I talk about it, the more we talk about it, maybe the awareness kind of creep in there. You know? And maybe some of the fear will go away. Mm, absolutely. Many times there are people who do not wish to have help. And I think True. a lot of people are afraid that if they offer help, they will somehow embarrass or anger the person that they're offering yeah, the help to. But what's wrong in saying... Nothing. Would you like some help? I can like always say help? yes or no. Absolutely. Exactly. But some people don't even say that. Some people just go and help you. <laughs> Say, please don't help me. Are you sure now? And, you know, it's this thing, you know, they want to grab you. Yeah. And they don't understand, I suppose, you know, uh, with a person such as myself that has a kind of a balance all my own. <laughs> I got my own kind of balance. And sometimes when I get out of cars, which, by the way, I have been designed for contortionists. Is that the right word? Uh, that, yeah. Yes, that's yeah. in any case. In, in any <laughs> case. You know, sometimes I look as though I'm going to fall down at any minute. But I'm not going to be ashamed saying, listen, uh, excuse me, sir, can you sort of just lean around here? So, in other words, I can say it. But some, some people, they go to the opposite extreme. Either you ask, 
either you're afraid to ask or you just go and help without, without uh, asking somebody, do you need it? And, so and, and that's really the answer, to say, can I help you? Exactly, and that's all. And then the you know. individual can say yes or no. Exactly. Yeah. But, you know, you still feel very uncomfortable. It's the fear, you know, still a little uncomfortable. Yes, and that's what needs to be done away with, mm -hmm. the fear, mm -hmm. the uncomfortableness. Mm. We'll be back right after these words. <laughs> Welcome back. Itzhak Perlman is my guest this evening. I read someplace where when you were 17 years old and you gave an award-winning concert that uh, Toby, who is your wife, at that time ran backstage, she had never met you before, and proposed to you. Yeah, it was in, actually, it was in a uh, music camp, in the summer, oh, yes? summer music camp, and I played, played a piece, and she just came backstage and said, will you marry me? What did you say to her? I, I was dumbstruck. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, 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 well, uh, let me think about it. <laughs> How long did you think about it? Oh, uh, about four years. <laughs> and then you said, no, we yes. Figured, we figured out that we have actually known each other for more than half our lives. Really? Yeah. You've been married how many years 18 now? 18 years. 18 years. And you were oh, 17 God, that's years. that's so frightening. Why? Uh, well, I, I used to say, how many years have you been? Oh, a couple of years, five years, six. Now I've got so many years to talk about. 18, 15, you know, that was 20 years ago. <laughs> you know, it makes you look, you know, it makes you look back all of a sudden and uh, it's many more years behind you. you yes. Know, getting there. Your wife also trained as a, a violinist, violinist mm -hmm. and uh, was quoted as saying, I was trained as a violinist, but yet I really love being in my home, spending the time with my children, helping them grow. Well, she's, uh, well, she's the most fabulous mother. I mean, she is a virtuoso mother, I must say. She's incredible. And uh, you have to be a virtuoso mother in order to have wonderful children. I mean, this is true. It is parenting for me is probably the most important uh, element in, 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 in raising kids or in anything, only next to teaching for me. I mean, it is uh, because it is so, so many things can go wrong and, and then so many things can go right, you know, and, and uh, so it's, it's a great challenge and, and she's wonderful at that and, uh, and she sort of, you know, she teaches me all the time. Yes. She teaches me all the time. I know that you have to travel a lot, but that uh, I've also read that uh, you still make sure that you have plenty of time to spend with oh, your Oh, yes. That's, uh, that's another w one of the great challenges is to how to look in the schedule and to see what you're going to what you're going to do two years from now and somehow picture it and feel it and know that you don't want to play that Wednesday. <laughs> that you don't want to play that, <laughs> that Thursday. I bet you've been wrong a lot of times. Oh boy, but I'm beginning to be terrific. I'm really? To, oh, listen, I'm, I'm now, this year, I'm seeing the fruit of my labor, of, of pouring into the, into the schedule and, and making sure that those spaces are all there, in those empty spaces between the, between the concerts. How many concerts a year do you do now? Right now I do about... 90, 95 concerts, which is, which seems a lot, but, mm. uh, you know, I used to do like 125, 130, and, uh, you know, after a while, you know, uh, when you do these concerts and you're away from home, uh, your kids don't know who you are anymore. You know, you, you come back from tour and, and they say, Dad, who? Who's that? Who, who's that man coming in? Yes. You know? So, and I feel that it's very, very important. So I just try right now to not to go on tours long tours. I don't go on long tours. I just do three days, four days, a week. You know, I even went to Japan the other day for eight days. Can you imagine going to Japan from New York for eight days? I How many four, days does it take to get there? Uh, Thirteen hours. Yeah. You know, I took the non-stop flight. I think I was there a total of nine days and I had eight concerts. <laughs> mm. <laughs> that was the end of that. I had eight concerts. Let's see, I had sushi, Chinese food, tempura, you know, I had... <laughs> I, read, I read someplace that you say you're on a seafood diet. Yeah, well, that's, that's... A lot of people I know are on seafood diets. You know, when you see the food, then, then you just eat it. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on that diet myself, oh, yes. <laughs> one time or another. Yeah, yeah. And, and what about the future? What is it, you know, like you said you've gotten very good at filling out the spaces and blocking yeah. out those spaces yeah. and yeah. knowing what you'll want to be doing two years from now. Yeah. Oh, what do you want to fill into some of those spaces for the future? Well, I tell you, uh, as you can uh, probably see from what we've been talking, you know, uh, musically speaking, 
musically speaking, I'm not going to go to any different direction. I'm going to go straight in the same direction that I've been going and hope that I grow more as I get older and that my music grows with me. You know, the, you know that in music there is no such thing as staying in one place. If you stay in one place, you get, you get go worse, backwards, yes. go backwards. So you hope that you keep growing and, uh, and that you keep finding new things that your x-ray vision, if you want to call it, uh, becomes more refined, that the, when you play you can see more of what's in the music and express it in a different way and in a better way and so on. And so that's, you know, I'm not very, uh, I don't ask for much, I just ask for that. And uh, on the other hand, you know, I just hope that uh, all of the uh, things that I've been talking about when it comes to people with disabilities, that hopefully that the goals that we are set for a better life, you know, more equal life, more mainstreaming, you know, more equal opportunities, you know, easier way to live. I hope that this continues to make progress. You know, I, I, I think progress has been very slow. I'm not very happy with, you know, I'm happy with the direction, but I'm just not happy with the speed. Yes. So I hope that uh, whatever I do in the future that would in some small way help uh, make this a little speedier all of the problems that we have. And you'll be watching some baseball games and some basketball, basketball games along games, the way. Listen, baseball, basketball, I'm telling you right now, if you're a New Yorker, you're not in very good shape. <laughs> you are so, I, I, so at least you can look on the bright side and says it can't get much worse. It can only get better. <laughs> I read that you are a Knickerbocker fan. Yes, yeah, sure. And that you watch all of the games and, yeah. and that you live in an apartment that was once owned or lived in by Babe Ruth. That's right. That's right. Did that sell you on the apartment? Well, absolutely. I mean, I saw the <laughs> two little marks on the wall where he used to take batting practice, and I said, I'll take it. <laughs> well, actually, it's not true. <laughs> but uh, we do have an apartment, uh, you know, we have a shower that we call it the Babe Ruth shower, <laughs> you know, because it has all sorts of, I don't know what, it has bats or something. No, actually. Yes. No. But, no, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting that uh, he used to live there. Is know. your wife, Toby, as much a fan as you are? Uh, uh, well, she was an original Brooklyn Dodger fan. Mm. And I don't think she has recovered yet. <laughs> that they left and <laughs> yes, went to absolutely. LA. So a lot of hearts real, were broken She's then. a real baseball fan, sure. Yeah. And your children? Children, sure. Uh, we got, well, we got so many, so each one is a different So many, uh, four. Five. 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 Five? Did I miss one? Sure did. I missed the baby. How old she, is the baby now? One year. I sure. did. Yeah. Because I thought you were younger. That's right. Wait a minute. Do I have a picture five. here? No, I don't. Oh, what a shame. I don't have a picture. I should have come with a picture. Well, never mind. Uh, you know, well, the baby, she's a, uh, she's a soccer fan. You know, she's a fan of the actual soccer ball. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, we have tennis in our house, tennis fans, football fans, uh, baseball fans. That's about it, I think. Mm -hmm. Basketball. We have uh, to take this last time out. Okay. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back. I just have enough time to thank my guest, Itzhak Perlman, for being with us this evening. I've really enjoyed talking with me you. Me too. It was a great pleasure for me. Thank you. And I'll, since we only have 20 seconds, I'll just tell everyone that we were talking during the commercial message, and he said that for the birth of his daughter, he had to come all the way from Los Angeles back to New York. He, you arrived in New York. Half a minute I made it. Half a, Half a minute, minute before she was yes, born. it was perfect timing. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. And thank you for being with us this evening. We'll see you on the next program. Good night.